All right. Well, it is fantastic to be here this afternoon and get to talk about something that has been on my mind a lot and that I think will be really helpful for you as you think through um, crafting your thank you space, because uh, all of us have one. Um, and I've come up with an acronym called CARE that I'd like to cover in the next 45 minutes and uh, with a lot of pictures. And it's kind of coming from what I view as the best seat in the house, so to speak. Um, Dave and I bought Franklin Fixtures five years ago, and it's a company that's been dedicated to bookstores, libraries, and museum stores since 1974. Uh, and colleges, and we've been involved in a lot of, of your stores and your stories, especially because um, the gift that I get is that we we get our dream of opening a bookstore um, a couple of times a week by becoming intimately involved with your needs and your insights and innovations and challenges. And we've never been busier, uh, which I love. It's a sign of confidence, and as people, as everyone's rethinking what they really need going forward. Uh, it's an exciting place to be. So I've, I'm really pulling uh, I'm the hope of transferring productive ideas about specifically your physical space and the use of fixtures. But the physical space is something we don't talk about a lot. And I've got two big teachers. Uh, you're the first key influence, all of the, 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 uh, the bookstores that we get to be involved with. And the second is a pattern language. And if you've heard me speak before, you've heard me probably talk about my favorite book, uh, one of them by Christopher Alexander. It's a compendium of uh, 253 patterns for architecture, bottom-up architecture. Um, but it begins with patterns that are big, like independent regions, the kinds of things that make walkable paths and make uh, the right spaces to put a physical store, um, all the way to pattern 253, which is really specific about things from your life, which is a pattern we'll talk about um, in this CARES model, but I, I may reference the patterns and just so you're familiar, that's what that's, what that's about. Um, one of my new friends uh, during uh, the pandemic, one of my gifts has been some time with Lisa Gazashti of Brookline Booksmith and she and I were talking about a pop-up store that she did and she kept telling the story of how people walked into this space um, and just exhaled and said, thank you over and over again, just thank you. And as they browsed and bought things and had wrapping, they just kept saying thank you. And that was her experience. And we, we started kind of pulling that apart and saying, what is involved in crafting a thank you space? Because probably more than ever uh, in, 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 my, in the history of my life, we need that safe space. We need that thank you space. Um, and as we talked, and as I talked to others, a framework kind of developed, and that's what I want to share today. It's a care model. Um, and it begins with C, crafting or creating that thank you space and, and being intentional about what it is that we're crafting. A, aligning the staff, the customers, and even your shelves uh, with the mission. Uh, R, acting with rigor in storytelling and display execution. And E, being very intentional about energy, uh, how it's directed and shaped and invited into the store. So we're going to look at all uh, four of those, the care model. Really just at the bottom line, it says, I care about you. I have thought about your life, customer, and I am part of your support system. And that's the message that we're trying to cultivate in all the things we're doing. Um, perhaps less is more. Um, though we have uh, less faculties, you know, it, it seems, you know, with our mouths covered with masks, so the eyes have it, and we have the opportunity for more meaning, connection, relevance, gosh, relevance, and operational success than ever before. I just stand in awe of the way that you are leading this country and co one community at a time, um, helping them work through um, all manner of uh, divides and and things that need fixing, and uh, and so we want to talk about how to do less and is more and how to use this moment. I'm going to divert just a second with a book by Peter Miller called How to Wash the Dishes. Um, I imagine some husbands would have taken umbrage with being gifted by this on Father's Day, but uh, my husband Dave ha is commander of the kitchen, um, perhaps a, a desperate 
measure on his part. But anyway, he's commander of the kitchen and he inspired uh, with the way he embraced this book. He actually got, was deeply moved when he read it. And let me tell you why. Um, there's a, a quote here uh, by uh, Thich Nhat Hanh that talks about, you know, are, are you paying attention to what you're doing? Um, if you pay attention to what you're doing, it'll help you overcome the habit of wanting to complete things quickly. If you smile to yourself and say, washing this dish, physically washing this dish, is the most important job in my life then when you are really there, washing the dishes can be a deep and enjoyable experience. But if you wash them thinking about other things, wasting your time and probably not washing the dishes well either. And, and for us, both of us, uh, me and Dave, that, that, Dave and me, that was a powerful idea that we wanna be present wherever we are. So I invite you to be present here and now and thank you for the gift of your time and the investment. I, it's my hope to make it really worthwhile. And um, this point carries into our stores because we're doing so many little big things uh, over and over again. And I think there is tremendous power in proverbial, proverbially washing the dishes. Um, I borrowed this cover from Ryan Raffaelli's uh, uh, Reinventing Retail and uh, the novel coronavirus, coronavirus resurgence of independent bookstore. We, much has changed since January. And in January, we were talking about how so much is remaining the same, how you as an independent bookseller uh, are, are the, 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 the history and the future at the same time. And uh, our ability, your ability to pivot during this time, to, to innovate, to connect, it's just been glorious. And um, so I love the things that we're seeing here. And a lot of that is, is, is in, um, in this package or in this, this next few minutes. As you're rethinking your space, and I know um, that many of you are, you know, let's focus, I invite you to focus on just one area that you'd like to be stronger. Is it the entrance? Is it to the right of the entrance? Is it uh, a certain section of books? Is it a certain area that you really want to, to focus on? Because being specific is always helpful um, as we go through something like this, this, think of this as a workshop and jot some notes and such, and I'd love to hear from you. Um, so let's talk about C, crafting a thank you space. So a thank you space can be this peaceful, glorious space. It can be a thought provoking space. It can be a funny space. <laughs> it can be a space that makes you laugh and smile. Um, there's all, all kinds of gifts in a thank you space. And we start out by thinking about the approach and flow. How do people get to your store? And I, I would suggest that that begins with all of the social media messaging, uh, your voicemail, the way you interact uh, electronically via email or text or with your customers. What messages and how are you giving those messages? Uh, that's part of crafting the space. Uh, because you craft a mental space before you craft the physical space. So the approach of um, flow physically too signals, I, I know I'm in a part of Tennessee, um, there's lots of Tennessee where masks are mandatory and um, we're in a, a city that seems to have said what virus and shucked the masks. And um, so I have this feeling every time I go into a store, I'm looking around, am I safe? Is this a place that's thought about my safety? Is this a place that's laid out in such a way that, that, that I can be responsible to the people that, that I have to be responsible to at the plant and to Dave. And um, so thinking about approach and flow and flow within your store uh, and touch points, uh, what people are going to touch. And I talked to my family member with the CDC. She used to be the director in Tennessee and she said, it's going to be a long slog. And I asked her specifically about bookstores and she said, it's hard. <laughs> you know, she suggested things like, you know, disinfectant at different stations and some of the things that you're doing. We're not going to spend a lot of time in that, but um, the, thinking through the service points, thinking through each of these, um, basically your safety measures say, we've thought about this. Our approach is clear. Uh, we're using distance cleaning, sanitation masks. Um, we just got a notification from OSHA uh, that in fact, there are 15 guidelines and that we are required to follow under general exposures. I didn't know because there's not been any specific legislation, but it falls under general exposures. And uh, with Tennessee OSHA, uh, it's a $7,000 fine for infraction. So that's kind of given us some guidance that we needed in order to come forward, at not, not with my own opinion, but with here is, here is something 
um, that you need to know. So that may be something you want to check out. Um, thinking about your flow path, you can just take a piece of paper and, and, and draw on it. But how do you want how do you want folks to flow through your store as you open up in stages, as you do? You've, one of the nice things I've seen a lot is that people have converted their store. You've probably converted your store to a, to a mail, you know, order fulfillment kind of space, which is totally different. So a lot of folks are saying my store is a mess, but the beautiful thing about a mess is that you've got to bring it back together and you can bring it back together in whole new ways. So thinking about your flow is, is really important because a good store is never done, just like a good house is never done. So thinking through things like this is book club bar in New York and thinking about the positioning of these chairs and how that's going to go and, and, and knowing that you've got fixtures that you can rearrange and thinking about how to do that. Uh, right on Books in, in St. Simons is a great clean example of um, a store with a lot of flexibility because all of the double-sided cases you see there have wheels there. And, and most of us have mobile fixtures uh, in the center for events and such. We can use that to reconfigure our spaces. We can use that to relay out our spaces. Think about those creatively um, and the dis around and the kinds of things you, you put on. This is, this is our chance to be clean and beautiful uh, and to really give some clear messages as, as folks come in. And um, Story and Song has two transition spots from the outside in, um, and they've had to think about how to do that and how to give folks a breathing spot. Um, notice the, the flowers, notice the pools of light uh, in Donna's store, notice how it invites you into different places you can exhale here. You can relax. Um, my, my family actually went on vacation to, not me, but uh, daughter and son-in-law, and they went on vacation to Amelia Island because of the messaging that came from Story and Song. I started sending the newsletter that Donna was producing, and my uh, CDC daughter-in-law, she was reading, and she felt very safe, and she felt very excited about the things that were happening, the messaging, the store, again, that approach. And so when they went to Amelia Island, the, the two boys, they found lots of things and they were able to go on the patio and, and both of them, they ended up going to Story and Song many times and it became central, the bookstore became central to their vacation, their vacation spot. And I imagine that that is and will be happening a lot. Um, we craft with the fixtures and my goal is to help you use what you have better and, and think through. What I love about Book Jewel here is that we have lots of different colors and sizes and shapes of fixtures, which is like a collection over time. And those layers are inviting and, and again, uh, welcoming and part of the thank you space. Um, here at Still North, they echoed some of those mixed materials. And you notice on the right with all the face out books, you know, we're shopping with our eyes. We've always said, you know, people buy 73% or 73% more likely to buy something they touch. So we've been geared toward touch. And now we're sort of re-gearing to say, you've got to be able to shop with your eyes and experience with your eyes. And they've done a nice job of making this a lot of feature face outs, um, but still feel like a welcoming real store. Um, speaking of real stores, one of my favorites, I love Books of Wonder in New York. And uh, Peter's always great about creating these pools of light that just feel so welcoming and wonderful and a lot of face outs and a lot of, um, you know, using the angles at the bottom to help really connect with the readers. Um, again, I've circled the mobile fixtures at Prologue Books here to say that these fixtures where they would normally be pushed out of the way for a, for a big event, maybe right now we're using them to create new flow patterns and to use more face outs and that sort of thing. Um, less is more, you know, fewer books or, you know, it still feels, it feels clean and clear and welcoming and uh, you can get clarity very quickly. Here's an example from the Raven bookshop and they, they added three new fixtures. Look at the difference that makes. Um, Instead of it feeling, uh, in, I think their term was it felt dowdy and uh, just kind of, those are new books on the shelves, but they don't necessarily look new because of the way they were shelved. And they really hadn't, um, just hadn't thought about doing something like this. And all they did were the three new, the three new fixtures, but look at all the face outs. And it, it again creates a thank you space that feels, feels like a whole different space. Um, and uh, I think, 
that uh, putting cards out like this is a different experience than putting them on a spinner. And it also allows that visual shopping or that, that and, and cards are huge right now. And I think they've gotten, uh, they have an opportunity to keep it even bigger because that personal note, that personal way of touching, um, you know, my granddaughter turns a year old uh, this weekend and I won't be there to see her. So, but a handwritten card and a special card uh, is another way of touching. Um, people spend about five to seven seconds spinning around a spinner. They spend about double digit seconds, like 10 to 20 uh, at minimum in, in front of a display like this. So thinking about how to use a, a, a regular, you can, you know, this is with accessories, you know, card uh, things, you can transition and put cards into a space. Wall systems with a clear, sweet voice. Um, again, this integration of merchandise that goes uh, together, it, it, it comes out and creates a very welcoming thank you spot for gift finding that you don't have to do a lot of gig digging and handwork. Um, crafting the modified thank you space. We've got Story on the Square in McDonough here. What a beautiful uh, rough draft bar they have. I love that name. Um, they've got this beautiful space and you have cafes too and, and communal eating is one of the pattern languages. We need communal eating and beverages to feel that thank you, to feel at home. So how do we deal with that? And some of you are doing, you know, take, you know, the takeaway and the cups with the lids and that sort of thing. So it's a lot to think through, but that's part of crafting it. Um, I want to think about every shelf, and this is thanks to Lisa Gazashti. Um, she suggested that to her, every shelf was like a nerve ending and that every book that was placed was like the end of that nerve ending. It was alive. It was infused with, with power. Uh, based on the placement, and it was very carefully chosen, and she was selling all remainders um, at the time in this pop-up, and they sold incredibly well, um, and we're seeing some of that in the trends where people are looking at, at, at uh, not necessarily uh, just new issues of things. I love the way the ladder frames the word joy here, um, and the, do think about ev the spark from shelves and, and how they work visually. Um, this is an image I just want to offer that each shelf and each book, each piece of merchandise is like one of these little points of light, one of these little nerve endings. And if we can think about it that way and be very selective, we can create this very powerful uh, thank you space. Like vol Volumes has done, I love their pools of light. Again, you, you feel like it's been very nicely, thoughtfully curated. Um, it really pulls you in. Um, with those pools of light. These are kind of some jarring pictures probably, uh, but they came from working with the libraries locally. I was working with four different library systems and uh, they're all connected to parks, which was something that they hadn't thought about, an asset they hadn't thought about. Um, but they all have entrances in the back spaces. And so I just took pictures as I arrived at different places. And this is what you arrive to. You arrive to a, a chain link fence and some HVAC units and and go in the back way and there's little display or no display stories spaces for youth. I just invite you to look with fresh eyes um, at the arrival experience and at at your store. Take some pictures because it really can be um, can be a, a powerful thing and in, in crafting. Um, and and from the C we move to the A in craft, which means alignment, alignment of staff customers, alignment around safety, inclusion, culture, storytelling, involvement, alignment on the kind of meaning that you want to create. Um, so I offer three different areas for alignment work. Um, and the organizational development person in me wants to, you know, uh, offer facilitation things, but, but you, you know how to do this. Um, the staff, the questions around, are we aligned around our response to the virus in this store? Are we aligned? around what our customers need right now from us? Um, those are big and difficult questions. And I know some stores have had some real difficulty uh, in working through responses to Black Lives Matter and to uh, the political situation that we're in, even to masking. Um, so that alignment is awfully important because you, you feel it when it's not there, for sure. Um, and then the, think about the silent sales staff, the fixtures. Your fixtures are part of 
the bones of your store. Um, are they aligned around the priorities in display and service? Are they reflecting those priorities? Are they telling the stories you want them to tell? Um, what are the stories that we want to tell? What do our customers need? And how do we help our fixtures make sure that they tell those stories? And then the patrons, customers, are we aligned in what kind of energy and action is invited into this space? Because um, if we're going to make it a safe space, uh, we're going to make it a, a fun space, a pleasant space, We've got to be clear about that invitation. And uh, so those are the three things. In reading um, Daniel Pink's book, When, in the, toward the end of it, he talks a little bit about alignment. Isn't that a great book? <laughs> he talks about alignment and the power. I used to do this exercise with groups that I um, understand was done with Native American tribes. And, uh, and you pick up rock, put it together, put it down, clap, pick up. And it's like a four-step thing. And the idea is that we didn't try to problem solve or have any difficult discussions until everybody was perfectly in alignment. And when you feel that rhythm, it's like being in a band. It's like singing in a chorus. It's like rowing in a boat or cooking in a kitchen with a bunch of people and, and being in a collaborative effort. When you're aligned, it, it feeds something in us, something, um, something real. Uh, it's, it's that energy, it's that energy flow. And we've got a lot of misalignment in our society today. So um, that, you know, thinking about creating alignment with intention is so, so important to everything else that we're going to do. Um, when we first started down the road of, of COVID-19, I put this slide together and thought that we should all wear a message on our face somehow <laughs> and say, you know, what's, it's our, it's our personal billboard opportunity. So what, if we've got that alignment, it makes sense uh, to, to, to make that a, a message or a billboard or something that's fun that connects everybody together, that everybody's got a piece of the message, ask me about or something. Um, I've taken to, uh, I, I, I take these and I write on them uh, literally. Uh, so depending on where I am and what I want to say. But um, mass messaging is part of that alignment. And the eyes have it all today. Um, make sure, speaking of alignment, that I'm talking literal alignment now with the eyes and the angles on the shelves. Uh, with the, the tipped bottom shelves here and with the angulation, someone standing should be able to shop the bottom of the shelf. And uh, we want to be intentional and thoughtful about how we're using those. Um, and being aligned, telling aspirational stories. This is a pre-COVID photo, obviously, but notice how few things are on the table. Uh, we have a book, we have a bookmark, we have a scarf, we have uh, some jewelry and some uh, pottery and some tableware and a, a, a beautiful bit of oil dispenser and a, and a pitcher. Um, it's, it, it creates an idea, it creates a space, aspirational. We'll talk more about that in a moment as we go into rigor, the R, C-A-R. So we've got crafting, we've got alignment. Now we have rigor, which is really like discipline, I guess. Um, intention, uh, effort applied to safety practices and regimes, display, storytelling, and key systems. Um, rigor involves all of the, the clean, safe, aligned, top to bottom storytelling through display elements, especially storytelling. And um, that's a surprising one to kind of pick, but you are a storyteller. You are a person who, who sells stories to others. So it makes sense that your display reflect your, your superpower of being able to tell a good story. Let's look at what that means. Um, here's one from Story and Song. And I love what Donna's created here, Donna has created from top to bottom. You've got the birds of paradise on top. And on the bottom, you've got that blue um, I'm going to say the wrong kind of bird, but <laughs> I would buy that table, that, that coffee table book uh, and possibly the poster and everything in between, because it's very easy to see in a blink that that display is about birds. Um, that display is about specific kinds of birds. I can comprehend it. I can shop it. I can connect with the bottom. And you notice on the bottom how she's using the feature face out shelves that are only a couple of inches deep. And this is, this allows those bottom books to come into the light. Uh, and she's using a different kind of acrylic stand on the bottom that keeps that one forward. Nothing sells in the shadows and things that fall to the back, they don't, they don't sell. And, and we're shopping with our eyes. So top to bottom, that's a, that's a good 
example. This is another one. Um, it's the story of food. And you know that because the, the book on top says it's the story of food. But if your eye follows it quickly, you see all around on this octagonal that top to bottom, it's the story of food. Um, and you can sell the bottom as long as the story starts from the top. So if you started with L-O-V-E, your eye naturally follows to the bottom. And being rigorous and intentional about that kind of display uh, and using our superpowers. Um, this four-way is another superpower kind of display. And I love uh, one way of telling stories is just to bring characters to life. So here's good old George, and he comes to life in in fun wear and what a gift center that Donna's created there. You can get plushes and books and all of the things all together because that character can be part of your life. Um, here's another one at Quail Ridge in, in North Carolina that's Bruce, the, the boss has come to life on Brick Slat Wall. Again, simplicity is, is, is key. You know, not being overly cluttered, but just really going for a single idea or point. Um, uh, Parnassus and, and Patchett, you know, has, have taken to video storytelling and hand selling online, uh, really working out of the store and working out of the, the shelves and such another way to bring characters to life. I love this one from cover to cover bookstore. Um, there are two little holes in the bottom of the cash wrap um, that she has there and they have miniatures one is miss mouse and one is mr mouse and they have these miniature paintings and miniature books and it's just delightful um because you become immersed in the story now that's that's a display that isn't selling anything but it's part of the experience of coming to the store the children look forward to it i think things change in the little diorama there and it's it's just a wonderful um way of, of saying you know let's create stories everywhere um, one uh, great adage is, is to show, don't tell. Uh, speak loudly, speak visually, and show without words. Since we're all in masks, that seems to make sense. Um, so bringing characters to life. This is my character, Millie. She's almost a year old, and she's without an eye. And if I just, if I just do these photos, you kind of get the idea. Millie was helping Dad on Earth Day plant a pear tree, and then... You know, she was really helpful at first, then kind of bored and really bored. Then she's really off the job entirely. Uh, eventually, it's just him. And it kind of describes her character and, and all that, that, that's in it. I just use those photos to say, when you've got a story, it can be a short one, a, be a beginning to end. It can be something simple about, um, like, I love Molly Idol's uh, wordless books here. That, so powerful. And putting the flamingo and putting the other things, show, don't tell. In fact, I should not talk and just let you look at these slides <laughs> for a minute because we've got um, the plushes together. I love this one, cookbooks for young shells. Well, we can tell a little, you know, um, but that very quickly orients you that what you're looking at is, is a set of cookbooks for young shelves, um, young chefs. And I like these, um, cards a lot because they're simple messages. Uh, hospitals should have comedy nights and mini bars. I think I bought like five of those. Um, Donna had trouble keeping that stock in, uh, I think this was also at Story and Song. Um, beautiful. And here's a great example of the aspirational lifestyle. You know, we are looking for hope. We are looking for, to create a way of being and living that is aspirational. It can be, you know, the aspirations on on the beach or in Florida, but it could be in, in any community in uh, the country. But look at how we've integrated the merchandise here. This is not just about a book. This is about how, how we can live. And I expect that book is going to help invite that along with the other merchandise. Um, you know, in, in creating a story, context is everything. And, uh, you know, my husband buys Chobani yogurt because of the story. Um, and so many people have, have told me this year that they've read our story and they wanted to work with us because our story reminded them of their own. And we all have these, these stories and uh, tell yours. Your personal story should be up front and right there, um, on your, not only on your social media, but when people come in, they should feel your story and see your story uh, throughout. Um, we've got a display right now that reflects part of our story from earlier this year. And, and gosh, there are 
even as we talk today, we've got hurricanes, we've got fires, we've got things happening all over the country. And in March, just before um, COVID became a, a, a real presence here in, in this community, um, we had a, a, a really bad tornado and lost about 750 homes and a lot of businesses. And um, that little boy right there, his name is Jonah, and he lost his mama. Uh, who's hugging him there. So uh, a lot of tragedies. That little girl, Hannah, she loves to be held and she's being held in heaven right now. She's um, a really sweetheart. And we lost um, 21 people uh, in this small community. And my bookstore friends, our bookstore friends, um, at the beginning, you know, when facing the coronavirus, facing uncertainty, sent us books for kids and for families that were about hope and handwritten notes. And um, in the face of the surreal, they sent us the power of one and children sent us love and rainbows and uh, pretty things. And it was just overwhelming. It was so beautiful. Um, it really, uh, I really felt the connection with this community that, that, that we've always wanted and craved. We, so many um, sent carefully selected books that struggling themselves, um, and these books matter more than, than ever as our story continues to unfold and people start to rebuild. And we told the story, we tell it over and over at the plant. No one comes into our office and you know they see some of the books that were sent. Uh, this particular display focuses on Max Licato and, and and all of his publications, but I, it gives me a chance to tell about all of that our book community and what it means to be part of that. And people get it; they get why we're doing what we're doing and and how it matters. And and I just love that. That's our story. So you've got yours, and I hope you're telling it because these our stories are are, are us. That is who we are. Um, we can also create suspense and have a little fun as we go, as uh, you know, here at Pages, you know, suspense can be just that I ordered this, but it's in a neat little bag and I've got, I've got little writing on it or somebody made a special note for me, or it can be the blind date with a book or um, any number of things. We can also uh, create positive takeaways that teach something important, you know, like a, an armchair vacation or something like that. Story on the Square, uh, did some positive takeaways by putting virtual displays about graduation and gifts for note taking and, and little collections and things, which is a great idea. Again, that, that aspirational energy and rigor kind of combine here. Um, rigor in display is, is evidenced in the w World War II uh, Museum in New Orleans. Um, what I love here is, is the way they've removed things to create a very clean display. Um, they turned around this one fixture and made it face out, which really uh, lets the D-Day message, um, you know, you, you really feel that when you walk in. And you also feel on the bottom where they've got the individual face outs. You can read those easily. I feel like I can shop this with ease. I feel like it's going to be a safe space for me to shop. Um, and it's, it's, it's a rigorous display. Uh, when I tell people that, that, they can change their shelves every week or two, and that they should. Um, I, I get these very big wide eyed looks like you've got to be kidding me. There's no way. Um, but consider it, please. Consider spacing, angles, consistent reconfiguration, because that's how you create the freshness in your store. That's how you really leverage the power um, of your displays. Um, and then back to the, two, the storytelling with two stories. Uh, John Gardner said once that there are only two kinds of stories. A man goes on a journey or a stranger comes to town. So if I was doing a display or we were doing a display in your store, which would we do? Would we do story top one, a person goes on a journey um, and do something like this and put it on, uh, you know, on our Instagram or, or would we do the equivalent of this? A stranger comes to town and, and uh, tell a fun story and make it, find some inspiration and then build around that. And it's just, it's really interesting. And that rigor feeds the energy. And that's the energy that we're inviting, cultivating and shaping with intention. Um, story on the square, Stephanie baked cookies or somebody did. She handed them out. Uh, 
Kroger's, you know, and people wanted to donate money. And she's like, no, no, I'm, 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 I'm giving you a treat for doing the right thing. <laughs> I'm trying to say thank you for wearing a mask. What incredible messaging that is. Uh, it really reinforces the why, because people would ask, well, why are you doing that? Why do you care? And, and Stephanie can respond, I'm doing this store because I care about my community and I care about you and I want to make a better space for all of us. Uh, it reinforces the why. Um, and I am wondering, you know, what if the mask helps folks discover books? Um, Lisa of Brookline Booksmith pointed out that it's a moment of intense interiority. You know, when you've got a mask on, and you're shopping, you're, it's not a social moment. It's not a moment that you're connecting with others. And, and we've seen the downside of that, felt the downside of that, but there's an upside. Um, and this moment of intense interiority gives people their, their silent spaceship to, to navigate and look for books and perhaps creates a, a personal experience that replicates the actual experience of reading. It's just the book and me. And um, I'm not, worried about talking with anybody about the book. I'm just finding the book. So maybe we can reframe the mask as an asset for this moment, as long as we need it. Um, speaking of reframing and energy, I'm reminded of my grandmother. That's uh, the yellow arrow is pointing to my grandmother, Marie Swallows. She was a, a teacher and a community leader and, and supported ball clubs and everything, but she and her sister had the town and country shop um, in Baxter, Tennessee. It's a little shop. And you see that big black line of decline? That's what she had just come through. So the point this picture was taken was the lowest point on that graph. It, it had been a tough time and she was an entrepreneur in, in many ways, um, but, uh, and, and, and always a worry or two <laughs> about how things are going. In this picture, she and her sister are transferring partial ownership to another uh, couple of ladies who are uh, women who are going to take the store forward in different ways. And I'm reminded of the, the courage that she faced and that we're not the first, we, and we won't be the last, uh, but we know that, that others have come through these kinds of places before us. And thinking about her, I uh, remembered and saw her silver tray, which was a, a possession of her. She died a few years ago. And um, I thought, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna polish this tray. And in the act of polishing the tray, kind of washing the dishes, I, saw her name emerge, Marie, and the dates of her, you know, her almost 50 years of teaching. And it helped me remember who I am and who I want to be and why I'm here. Um, and as her name emerged, as all that emerged, I thought about education and community and service and small business. And I thought, grandmother, you're right here with me. This is, you're, you're doing this with me. I called her Mur. Um, and I took that silver tray and pretended I had, had a store. And this is, you know, pattern number 253, things from your life. And I took that into uh, my proverbial store and made a display here with my grandfather's vintage ties with Officer Clemens and, and Mr. Rogers uh, with cards that were, this was around Father's Day, uh, thinking about athletics and the importance of, um, that leadership right now at this point in history and, and was able to make a display that, that, has, that is born of a lot of meaning. I can talk to it, but I don't have to because you can feel it. It's in the tray. <laughs> it's, in, it's infused in the display. And if I took all that off and I just put one book because she was an English teacher and she taught remarkable manuscripts, she would love this book. Um, and I had the courage to put just one book out um, to make it really special, that book is going, someone's going to, to take that book home and, and love it as much as I do. Um, or I could take the tray and put her cookbook on it because she loved to cook and have, have company. Or I could add to it and add spoons and spoon rests and another cookbook or two. Um, adding an object, what's yours? Pulling an object from your home uh, pulls your own soul into the display. Um, and that's what you want to do. At Story and Song, the Skimming Stone is just a beautiful example of pulling together pottery and napkins and, and a tray and, and of doing that on a simple slat wall here. Um, it can happen anywhere. Um, going toward energy and light. Uh, light is to the eyes what music is to the ears. So just like when we're listening to a, a movie and we hear ominous 
music, you know, we know something bad is about to happen. The same thing happens with light, uh, darkness and light. And so you notice in, in the first photograph on the left, how the uh, beautiful home books are face out and forward into the light. They're, they're on future face out shelves that are taller and back and not so deep because things don't sell in the shadows. They need the light. Um, and, and you get that, that difference. On the other hand, if you have subdued light and pools of light, it invites you to linger. There is no fireplace there, but we kind of intuit that there is one because there's a fireplace screen and there are some uh, electronic candles. They're beautiful and it creates this idea all around light. Integrated display is another way of storytelling and of putting these, these beautiful dishes with these beautiful cookbooks and using the pyramid effect of the fixture itself to, to pull those things together. And I really love the textures and the feeling in this Old Town um, open book store uh, in Virginia and how the, the, uh, the feature face outs of all of those books, it's just a soft feeling. Um, it's not telling a specific story here uh, but it is crafting a specific kind of space. Um, and the energy at Parnassus in Nashville with the oak uh, for fixtures, uh, they recently added the one that Karen's got her hand on, which was made to match the others that are in the store already and the mission table. Notice that the mission table is not quite at waist high. We're gonna talk about waist high in just a second. Um, so we create waist high with the riser because waist high flies. Um, and the ambience of the store, part of it, is, is created with the, the, the fixtures and the way that they're laid out and, and done. Here you see the energy and the movement in Parnassus um, and how just uh, standing back and thinking about the energy and the flow. I love the feature face outs on the long table because you can easily see them and they sort of draw you in for more browsing. Um, in Commonplace Reader, which is in a, an older home, these fixtures are made to fit. And you notice waist high is for all heights and all ages. So everything from the windowsill to the, the table is all designed to kind of have that superpower of meeting people at the waist. Um, this has an energy, uh, you know, the Sesame Street kind of energy it comes at you with those big eyes uh, and you feel the energy coming at. So every, to me, every display held by every fixture has personality uh, or should have personality. Um, I love the personality and energy, the, the elegant energy and unlikely story here and the, the books. I, I, I feel somewhere between a, an elegant kitchen and a, and a library, but it, the angles are subtle, but very important and carry some of the energy. Those, those angles in the shelves, you notice those are not flat shelves. Those are all angled shelves and they all meet the eye. So you create the energy with light and color and material and you bring the energy in yourself um, and you invite the energy with that customer interaction and with the words you choose. And in Terabang is choosing some great words when they talk about we're open as we innovate and uh, we're about to send their fixtures off next week and they're uh, going to be reconfiguring the it's all set with these people messages with with masks you can just feel the excitement in that store uh, and and it's exciting to to get ready to go um, picking some odd contexts with engaging and our little sandwich boards or boards outside uh, I love the creative things that I, I see and one of my favorite is I can remember the title but it's blue um, a simple idea that creates a a fun smile and and perhaps a connection with uh, reading with curated collections that they hadn't found before um old town books did that with quarantine reads and and created engagement so participation is key and when we can't participate in the normal ways we find uh new ways and i like this one a lot um i also want to read this book and i'm and the mask in uh at uh, octavia um by Ted Jackson, it looks like uh, it has a bit of mystery to this author to me. Um, and, and I love the energy that is, is reflected in his eyes and reflected in people. Um, I use this example, this is, I, I did some consulting with the local library systems about uh, reconfiguring. And you can look at these pictures and see that there are some drains on energy here. Um, 
So this is kind of a what not to do, isn't it? Um, you know, the top picture with the blue sofa, there's literally nothing to look at there. You know, you, you literally have no books and nothing to pull you in, nothing to engage. And the puzzle, which is intended to engage a great idea for engagement, not so much in coronavirus, but um, before, before that time it was, but notice the height of the chairs compared to the height of the table. Uh, there's no way you can sit there comfortably without doing this, you know, <laughs> and then we've got Norman, the uh, iguana, I think it's the iguana, lizard or iguana or something. He's, he's, I don't get too close to him, but um, the kids like him a lot <laughs> and he's in that beautiful tank, but notice the, the signs and the, the pieces of paper stuck. It, it really kind of takes away from the whole experience of visiting Norman. And then behind the cash wrap, that's a real mess. And it's easy for things to be a mess. You can look behind me and see a mess. Um, but it's a, um, but that, that mess creates a sort of energy with it. And so to clean that up, they're, they're doing some really nice things to, to have some nice befores and afters. Uh, but I invite you to, to take some pictures in your space that is right now um, and ask yourself these questions about your energy. How do they get to your door? What's outside your door in terms of energy and messaging? How do they prepare themselves to enter your space? And what are your window displays and signage saying uh, to folks? Uh, what, what kind of physical approach do you have? Um, and then are you missing any opportunities like this one? This is also in the library, but they've got these beautiful uh, end cap, not end caps, but slat wall ends that could be doing feature face outs up and down and carrying energy. Instead, they're sort of losing energy. Um, Energy is also found in specialness and scarcity. People leave their houses, uh, leave their phones for an experience, and they want to find something they can't find elsewhere. And, um, you know, isolating something under glass and making it special and scarce is really a good way to think about display. Um, another thing that I love to do is bringing the outside inside. Now, Donna's done two things. She's got a story. That log was one of the trees that fell that fell during a hurricane um, and it sort of represents what they came through together and then you've got the energy of the, the flowers and a beautiful display around but making those connections uh, a local connection and local stories that connect with the display uh, physically um, you can also it's also a pattern language to bring life in um, so plants animals fish reptiles succulents I love what eShaver, they're, they're very trained cats who sit on stools are pretty incredible there. Uh, and a big part of the personality of that store. Um, and then you've got the piece of, of the plant that is the, the topiary here. And um, it, you know, thinking about how you bring uh, that wildlife in and that real life in. Um, energy also comes in color. Um, and my made up phrase is waist high will fly below that falls flat. Um, waist high, there's a reason in museums that all of the displays are really waist high. And for some reason in our retail, we have not achieved that. We know that people look at things and see things and, and interact with them more at waist high. Uh, it's a pattern language. I didn't make that one up, uh, but I have observed it in action and seen it to be very true. So um, if it's, going to be below waist high, you've got to make the connection. And here the connection is made with color. There's a, there's a base over there that's orange. There's orange in the carpet, orange in the vase, orange in the books. And you see it just kind of flows. Your eye flows with that energy of that color. Uh, the same is happening here still with the oranges and, and that color just popping out of a, uh, just a plain white uh, flared fixture. Uh, Briars and Brambles and Wind of New York did that with these beautiful, um, Notebooks, just color, um, pops with energy and just, um, this could be merchandised so many other ways, but doing less and, and letting color carry it is important. What a difference a page makes when you think about opening a book. Um, be intentional about the color you're introducing. Are you introducing the peaceful greens or the exciting oranges or something that's more temperate like sky and wood? Um, color is important. And texture is important in uh, book tool here they've got a lot of textures in their cash wrap uh, and in the whole store again it looks collected over time um, but using texture is one of the ways of crafting 
a thank you space because we, we feel calmed by the sense of, of collections over time. It's, it's like a house. It's like a place that's been lived in. Uh, a lot of textures in this, and I love that it's both an illustration of waist high display and of top to bottom. You, you can shop those candies on the bottom because you see what's on the top. And clean, clear energy here at Bookies. Um, very organized. You feel like you're walking in and, and you're going to be able to find things easily and clearly. I love how they've mixed games and puzzles and candles and all of these different things together in a way that's clean and beautiful. Um, you know, where you don't have waist high, you want to create it and a, a riser can do that or an object from your home. Uh, but one of the points of this slide is to just start with a blank slate, clear the table, <laughs> start all over, <laughs> start your display at ground zero. Don't just add to something. Um, uh, but uh, in executing the care model, you know, you're saying, I care about you. I've thought about your life. I'm part of your support system. So this display, every display is a, is a fingertip touch where you're taking a book and you're hoping to connect with their energy and uh, with, with, with a book so that you're doing this. You're creating a space where people can exhale and be thankful and be appreciative and have a, um, have a moment that they can't have any other place. Um, according to Peter Miller, you will know the state of your state of mind when you wash the dishes, your care or your impatience, your attention or your distraction. You will see yourself at that moment clearly. The supercharging for us for, for in this moment is our opportunity to pay attention to everything and try very hard to focus on that thing. Um, it is a path to sanity, <laughs> I do believe. Um, I hope you have questions. I hope you have something to chew on, uh, like Millie with her little giraffe there. Uh, and I hope you'll send me some messages um, and know that, that, that I know that you're in the lead. In our country today, you know, your bookstore is shaping our experience now and helping us craft our future. Your work has never mattered more. Uh, and I, Dave and I feel privileged to be a part of it. The 33 people who work at Franklin and Cookville, Tennessee feel proud to be a part of it. Um, and uh, we, we wanna support the good work that you're doing. We know at first glance it may seem too hard, but look again, always look again. Such good resources that have been put together for us here and uh, I appreciate Linda Marie and um, you and Linda Marie and uh, Eileen and gosh, you guys have done a tremendous job putting all of this together. Um, my email is, is up here and I'm also in the exhibit hall and I'm hoping to bind some lasting things together. So thank you.